Well, good morning, church. I hope you're all doing okay. Uh, you're doing well. I see that some of you have a smile on your face, so you are thankful. And you are uh, thankful for uh, a day that, uh, again, we can just celebrate the goodness of the Lord. A day where we can set aside the busyness of the week. And it's a good time. It's a good season we're in. Even though I think we should always be in a season of Thanksgiving. But I'll trust that you will be blessed and encouraged today as well. You know, the Bible commentator, uh, Matthew Henry, he uh, was robbed one day when he walked down the street. That evening, he wrote in his journey, be thankful. And he said, I'm going to make a list of thankfulness. And he first said, he said, first, I'm thankful because I had never been robbed before. Secondly, because although they took my wallet, they didn't take my life. Third, because although they took all that I had on me, they still didn't take much. Fourth, because it was I that was robbed, not me robbing. You know, in the midst of horrifying experiences, he expressed thankfulness. He was thankful. It wasn't a good day for him, but it was a, a godly day. You know, it wasn't a good day, but it was a godly day. For some of you, it may have not even been a good year, but I trust it was a godly year. Not every day is going to be a good day, but it, let it be a godly day. God, who has given us so much, May he give us one more thing, a grateful heart, a heart that is filled with thanksgiving. You know, God's word makes it clear that thanksgiving for Jesus' followers shouldn't just be a day. It should be a life, a life that we live every day. Thanksgiving should be every day. So I'll call it thanks living. The two most frequent commands of Scripture are be joyful, be thankful. And when the Word of God commands us, then we really want to do that, right? Because we are followers of Christ. Joy and gratitude aren't options that gives us, that God gives us based on our circumstances. They are to be priorities that we live by no matter what the circumstances are in our lives. And that's only possible when joy and gratitude in our lives are not based on the circumstances. They're not based on what goes on around us. They are based on who lives in us. Let us read Psalms 30 verse 11 and 12. Here David cries out to God in worship. He says, you have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I may sing praises to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will, thank, I will give thanks forever. Now instead of grumbling about our temporary circumstances, God wants all of us who have tasted his grace, his goodness, his love, that have all experienced that, that, he, that we will be forever joyful and thankful for all the eternal promises that he has given us. But have you ever noticed that there are certain enemies that we have to fight against when it comes to be giving thanks always? There are enemies that we have to constantly fight against. So I'm going to run a few of those by with you first. In other words, let's get the negative out of the way first, right? And then we'll go to the positive. First, we have to fight familiarity. We have been blessed so much. More than we even often realize or imagine. And so we have been blessed so much 
that we become so familiar with it that we forget. We forget the blessings of God upon our lives. And then we become complainers, right? That's a good reminder when the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He's the one who made you from dirt. Read your Bibles in the beginning of the Bible. It says he, he made us from dirt. He, he's the one that puts breath in your lungs. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He's the one that has given you life. He's the one that created you. He's the one that has power over your life. He's the one that made you for him. He blesses you for him. So we have to fight against the enemy of being familiar, so familiar that we forget. Secondly, we have to fight entitlement. Listen, anything I'm going to say on that is it's all American language, okay? Entitlement. Entitlement is the belief that we deserve privileges or special treatment or have rights to certain things, right? That's entitlement. Uh, you know, in other words, we, we may feel so entitled, and yet we don't get it sometimes. Maybe somebody says, you know, we would be great parents. We deserve children. Why isn't that happening? And having the attitude of entitlement. Some of the singles may say that, well, I, I, I'm staying pure sexually. I'm faithfully pursuing Jesus. Why am I still single? Shouldn't I be able to enjoy the blessed marriage like my Christian friends do? Some of you may say, I, I, I'm, I'm faithful with my finances. I, I, I have been faithful for a long time. Why am I still struggling financially? I mean, don't I deserve a higher pay like my Christian friends? And the attitude of entitlement, it's an enemy that we have to fight against. The truth is, as sinners, the only thing that we deserve is God's wrath and judgment. Jesus is the only one who has ever been entitled to every blessing of God. And yet he chose to give up his own desires, his own comfort, his own rights, and his own pleasures for our eternal good. Another enemy we need to fight is instant gratification. Uh, we talked a little bit about this at our men's Bible study on Thursday. You know, instant gratification is when we do something or want something that brings us short-term pleasure, but then it will bring us long-term pain and problems. Instant gratification. You know, we, we often want it now. Somebody calls it the disease of now. In America, we are being shaped through politicians that you need to have an attitude of now. Have you ever noticed that there's a lot of waiting going on in the Bible? I looked at it this week and you know, Noah had to wait for a long time until he could get out of that ark and back on dry land. Israel had to wait 400 years before God would deliver them from the slavery of Egypt. Abraham waited a long time before God would give him his first son. The people on earth at that time waited a long time for God to send His Son that He had promised. Waiting is a necessary part of growing as a person and as a disciple. The need for instant gratification holds back a spiritual growth in our life. 
It, does, it cannot grow our patience. It cannot grow our contentment. It cannot grow our self-control if we want instant gratification. Instant gratification lessens our overall appreciation because we are always quick to the next thing. And I want this, and I want to feel it now, I want to have it now. When we refuse to wait, then we hinder our ability of how our current decisions have a huge impact in our future destiny. If you don't have a sense of how your yesterday has affected you today, you will give very little thought on how your today will affect your tomorrow. Instant gratification. Those are some of the fights that we have to fight against in order to have a thankful heart and have a thankful living. Now, what fuels tanks living? Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. I'm going to read this to you. Verse 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish, uh, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to God the Father through Him. So first, tanks living is fueled by a heart that is ruled by the peace of Christ. And I want to read verse 15 again. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Now the peace of Christ is offered to us as a gift to all who are willing to receive it, to submit to it, to surrender to it, and receive it as God's gift for you. I'm also going to read in, in John chapter 14, 27. Here Jesus says this. He says, My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Now when you look at Colossians 3.15 and you look at John 14.27, one thing that we notice in these verses is that we have a choice in the matter. We have a choice in this. And the peace of Christ, we have a choice. Sometimes we, we tend to uh, want to uh, uh, say, oh, it's, it, it's all from, from the Holy Spirit or, or this is all from the devil. But here, this is you, okay? You have a choice in the matter. You can trust what you can see or you can trust in the one who has control over everything you can see and everything you cannot see. It is your choice. This is for all those that are willing to receive it, to submit to it, to humble themselves and receive that. Now, let, let me give you an illustration that, that maybe helps understand this better yet or maybe deeper. If it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And in, in, in John 14, 27, Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be afraid. That is your choice. That is my choice. He, he gives us that freedom to choose 
for us to choose that, to submit to that, to receive that as a free gift from him. Now, when I think of that, to, to let the, the peace of Christ rule in my heart and not let my heart be troubled or, or be afraid, I, I, I'm thinking about it for my own personal life. I, I think of it this way and, and also the things that I go through right now is what, when you have a tragedy happening in your life or in your family, you have the shock. And you have to deal with the shock. And then you may have some more shocks in your life because more things happen in your life that are just tragic. And they, they really have an impact on you. They, 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 uh, they, they tear your heart to pieces. And it hurts and it's painful. And then I have a choice in that. Am I going to let Jesus' peace in my heart rule in my situation that I am going through right now? Or will I let my heart be troubled and be afraid? I don't know what the future will bring for Gemma. We got a very bad report yesterday, and it was heartbreaking. There was another shock. It happened like 30 minutes before uh, our dinner that we found out about it. Uncertainty. Now, will I submit to the peace of Jesus, that the peace of Jesus can rule my heart going through some of these things and not let my heart be troubled not let my heart be afraid of what may to come. Will I us in the one that has the control over everything that I can see or that I cannot see? Or will I have a heart that's going to be troubled? Will I have a heart that is going to be afraid? Listen, so many times people will not submit and receive the peace of Jesus to rule over their heart. It's only based on circumstances. If they don't do that, their hearts will be troubled. There will be fear. If, let me put it this way. If Elena and I would both not let the peace of Jesus Christ rule in our hearts over the circumstances, pretty soon we would get very annoyed with each other. We would get mad at each other. We would get mad at the church. We would, get, we would fight with one another. Our, our marriage could even end up in divorce. We would be mad at almost anybody that uh, may said something that we really didn't like or appreciate it. But that's what's at stake when your peace is based on circumstances. But that's also the power when you submit as a Jesus follower to the peace that Jesus offers and let that peace rule your heart. But it's your choice. But that is a peace that the Bible talks about that will bypass your mind. Because in your mind, you can't comprehend this. You can't control yourself in it. You don't know how to deal with it. But it will pass your mind and it will go into your heart. And it will rule your heart. And whatever rules your heart will direct your mind. Let me give you another, a different illustration. Some of you can maybe relate a little bit better to this one. How many of you 
are playing sports or have played sports in the last five years? Raise your hand. I want to see that. There's a bunch of athletes in here. You're playing. Some of the adults, you're playing softball. Yeah, there's a, there we go. There's quite a few more hands. So here I want to have an illustration that you get, okay? You have an empire when you have to play sports, right? You have an empire. If I'm truly in Christ and Jesus is truly in me, he is like an empire. Like an empire is at sports and games. In other words, his peace umpires my life and calls the shots. That means whenever things creep into my heart, whether it is conflict, whether it is problems that press in, I can respond well by choosing to listen to the one who is the ultimate umpire in my heart and in my life. I'm going to tr choose to trust him. Not what I can see, but in the power and the presence and the promises of Jesus who loves me, who came for me, who gave his life for me, and now he walks with me through everything that I go through in life. I'm going to put my trust in him. Who, who is he that has all the power over me? When I cling to the peace that is in the person of Jesus Christ, it calms my heart. And then it focuses my mind. Now, having said all of it, I think it's maybe worth saying this. We all deal differently with emotions. When you go through a crisis, you will probably deal different with that, with your feelings, your emotions, than probably anybody else around you. We all deal different with that. So, what I want to say with that is this. If you go through a hardship and crisis in life, and somebody in your family just cries a lot and weeps a lot and is so heartbroken, it's okay. And it's not your job to think, what's wrong with you? Don't you believe in Jesus or suck it up? No. That's how they deal with that crisis. And if somebody in your family uh, deals with the emotions and, and it seems like he doesn't care, I mean, he's not crying, he's, he's not uh, weeping, and it just feels like he's just, it's, it's just careless. No need for you to make him feel guilty because how we deal with our emotions is with how we, is God blesses us and has created us in different ways so that we need each other to care for one another. But we, there's no need to feel bad or awkward or different. And there's no need not to cry if you feel like crying. But I think it's, it's worth mentioning. Now, do you know another amazing miracle that this piece will do for you that here he talks in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15? This piece will not only just provide harmony in your heart, it will also provide harmony in the church. Let me read those verses again to you, or that verse, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. So Paul is speaking to the whole church. You know, many members but one church, they're all connected. When somebody hurts, we hurt with them. When somebody cries, we cry with them. When somebody rejoices, we rejoice with them. So in other words, as we as individuals, we submit and receive the peace of Jesus that rules our heart. 
And then we are together. Not only now does that provide harmony and peace in me, but also in the whole church. Did you know that people who can't get along with others are generally people that can't get along with themselves? Negative, critical people are unhappy with you because they're unhappy with themselves. In, in other words, many times the hurt and wound they try to inflict on you is the hurt and the wound that they carry themselves in their heart. And they're used by the devil to make you hurt and feel bad. And that somehow gives it some devil's blessing and makes it a little bit more comforted, comforting to their own pain and hurt. A lack of peace ruling in our hearts will produce a lack of peace ruling in the church. You can count on it. Let me give you one more point. Thanks living fuels the uh, is fueled by a heart that is ruled by the peace of Christ. And then secondly, thanks living is fueled by a mouth filled with thankfulness to Christ. If you look at verse 15 in Galatians 3, the last part, it says, and be thankful. And then you look at also verse 17, the last part, and it says, give thanks to God the Father through him. Now, both of these are meant to be continuous. Keep on being thankful. Keep giving things. Never stop. Never stop. Never stop. No matter the circumstances, no matter what happens, keep on being thankful. Keep on living thanks living. Keep on saying thank you, God. The Bible is filled with commands of being thankful. I'm not going to read it, but you remember the story in Luke chapter 17 where Jesus healed the ten lepers? Uh, and uh, only one returns to say, thank you, Jesus. Jesus seems to be a little surprised, right? He says, where are the other nine? Didn't I heal nine more? You know, Jesus, not only did he give them their health back, but he also gave them their families back, their friends back, their dignity, their future. In a sense, Jesus raised them from the dead. He gave them their lives back that they did not have. Now, wouldn't you have loved to be able to go to the other nine and ask them, why did you not return to Jesus and said verbally, thank you, Jesus? Maybe hug him and say, thank you, Jesus. Sure, we would have loved to do that, right? I think if you could have done it, I think uh, one would have probably said, listen, body, I just did what I was told. I went to the priest, and I showed me myself to the priest. I didn't know I was supposed to come back and say thank you. They never told me that. Another one may say, hey, you have to understand, I hadn't seen my family in years. I needed to see my wife and my children, my grandchildren. I hadn't seen them in a long time. So I had to go and see them first. I meant to go back, but then once I was ready, I lost track of Jesus. I didn't know where he was. Another one may would have said, I mean, I am really thankful for what he did for me. But I didn't expect, thought that he would expect me to come back and, and say thank you to him yet. I mean, after all, doesn't he do this for a living? I mean, don't the, the, the uh, religious people pay him to do this? Another one may have said, you know, I didn't come back because I wasn't 100% sure if it was really Jesus that healed me. You know, I had been researching on Google uh, on how to cure leprosy and uh, I discovered that there is this natural herb, and if you're going to use it, uh, eventually that will cure you and heal you and cleanse you from leprosy. And I've been, I had been using that for already six weeks, and I thought it was just a coincidence that it happened when Jesus spoke those words. That's why I did come back. Even though none of us have physical leprosy, but we all have it spiritually. In the Bible, leprosy always represents sin, suffering, and shame. Just as physical leprosy was incurable and fatal, so is our leprosy 
spiritually. It's incurable, it's fatal. Romans chapter 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. We are all born with the terminal disease of sin. We got it from our parents, they got it from their parents, they got it from their parents, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. It's incurable and fatal. No one in the Bible ever was mentally, excuse me, medically cured from leprosy. Every time somebody was cured and cleansed for leprosy, it was always through a miracle, not through medical. You and I cannot be cured of sin. It has to be cleansed only by the miracle of Jesus. You know the special song, He washes us clean, He purifies us. It's only through the blood of Jesus. An old hymn song says, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, do you think that those other nine lepers who didn't come back, that they didn't feel thankful? Sure they did. I believe they felt very, very thankful. There's no doubt about it. But they did not give thanks. Feeling thankful isn't the same thing as giving thanks. Jesus expected more from them than just feeling grateful or having their lives been given back to them. He expected them to express it, to say it, to show it, to demonstrate it. Why? Because gratitude isn't just a feeling that you feel, but it's also a, resp a, a response that you give to communicate your thankfulness. Hebrews chapter 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. You know, I'm just going to close it with that. And uh, just want to say this. Think about it. What would that look like if God would bless us with the same measure of blessing that we give to him? In other words, what would that look like in your personal life if God would bless you with the same measurement of how you thank him, how you worship him, how you express your appreciation and your thankfulness to him. What would that look like? I trust that it would be a great blessing from God. And I think every day should be a thanks living. Not just one day of the year, but every day. The worship team can make their way up for a closing song, but I just want to encourage you and challenge you with this. Do you have a troubled heart? Do you have a fearful heart? Or is the peace of Jesus Christ ruling in your heart? If you are troubled, fearful, for all of Jesus' followers, Jesus offers all of us the peace to rule over our heart. But we have to receive it. We have to submit to it. We have to surrender our lives to that, to him. Now, I'm going to do a closing prayer. After the prayer and after the song, we're going to uh, do a communion. But uh, you don't need to worry about if you are not wanting to stay for communion. After the closing song, I'm going to give clear instructions for you can be dismissed. But I do want to say that every Jesus follower is invited to take part of communion. Whether you're a member here in this local church or not, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should celebrate and give thanks to Jesus for what he has done for you through communion. Please stand for a closing prayer. Lord God, we're so thankful for your love, for your goodness. We're so thankful for Jesus, for going to this cross to pay for the penalty of our sins, to purify us from our sins, and to make us free and to make us followers of you, to set us apart, uh, to be your children, God, to do your work. And Lord, we are so thankful that we can 
we have a choice in this and that we can receive and surrender and submit to your peace, Jesus. And that your peace will then rule over our hearts. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what we go through life. And I pray for every individual, every listener, if they have a troubled heart today, or maybe they're afraid, I pray that they would submit and receive your peace, Jesus, this morning, right now. Now you will give them a peace that will bypass their mind, that will bypass their understanding. Now they will just sense your presence, that they will sense your peace that only you can give beyond any human being could offer. And I pray that we can worship you that we can thank you, we can praise you because you are good, Lord. You love us. And thank you. We appreciate you.